All right. Well, it is 12 o'clock, and so we will just continue to let people pop on, but we want to go ahead and get started. And I am expecting some really great things today because, you know, this event has truly been guided and directed by God. Initially, when Carl and I discussed this, we discussed focusing on organizational capacity, but it was in a much more broad sense. And while it remains centered on organizational capacity, capacity, God really orchestrated and really just kind of honed our focus in on the people we serve alongside. So I can't wait to dive into the theme of our event today, which is empowering people, building organizational capacity. And I love people. So I'm excited about exploring empowering people together today. And this is going to be so much fun. Today, we get to hear from Amy Soswadell, who will share insights on growing and caring for a team. And then Amy Guilford is going to share her insights on developing a board of directors, and Dave and Cheryl Belden are going to share their wisdom on recruiting volunteers for marriage ministry. And I also do just want to remind everyone about National Marriage Week. It's taking place from February 7th to the 14th, and we really need a favor from all of you. We need the entire CMI family to share pictures and video clips of events, pictures of yard signs, postcards, or any promotional materials that are related to National Marriage Week. If you have links to event registrations, podcasts, social media posts, anything that's promoting National Marriage Week, please send them to me at sammy.soltmans at gmail.com. And we would love to see pictures with you or someone else in the picture. So if you're gonna send us a picture of a yard sign, we would love to see you or somebody else standing next to it. Or if you created a postcard, we'd love to see you holding that in the picture. And we do also wanna remind you to remember to use National Marriage Week graphics and the National Marriage Week hashtag on all of your print and digital media. I sent those all out to you, but if anybody needs those again, feel free to reach out to me. We would also love to see the hashtag on print materials as well as social media to help build awareness. So please tag us in all of your social media posts and you can do this by using the hashtag symbol followed by National Marriage Week, all together with no spaces. And, you know, we have cities from all over the country that are celebrating National Marriage Week in their own unique ways. And we are just excited to see all the innovative ideas that you have. We've got communities who are doing community-wide marriage blessings, glow bowling, comedy date nights, marriage proclamations, podcast interviews, movie theater ads, and so many more. And so we just love seeing all your unique ideas. And we can't wait to highlight the work that you're doing for National Marriage Week. So your help on this is going to be so valuable to us in our efforts um, to highlight the impact of National Marriage Week. So in advance, we just want to thank you so much for taking the time to help us with that by sending us video clips and pictures and links. We really appreciate you doing that. Before we begin today's training event, we always want to open with prayer. And I want to introduce you to one of our newest family members, our newest CMI family members. His name is Shane Bowman. And Shane and his wife, Renee, are diligently working to make a positive impact on marriages in Western North Carolina. And Shane's going to be leading us in prayer today. So Shane, whenever you are ready. Hi, guys. A quick shout out to my friend Avon. I see you on there. Good to see you, Avon. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I want to lift up uh, these marriage champions here today. Um, all the speakers, uh, the topics that we're discussing today and, and how to build a team and an advisory board and um, just recruiting volunteers for these uh, CMI families and 
uh, the organizations that we're trying to put together here, Lord. We pray that your hand of blessing will be upon each and every one of these couples um, and all of the people who are involved with this. And God, that uh, ultimately you'll be glorified by what happens through all of these things. May uh, may we champion marriage in a way that, uh, that lifts you up, um, not ourselves, Lord, but to lift you up. I pray that uh, this meeting today would go to your will and to your glory. And God, just bless all of those who are involved today. And may we go forward after this uh, with more knowledge um, in just in, in the walk that we have um, in leading marriages. God, we praise you and we thank you and we uplift your name. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for praying, Shane. We really yes. appreciate you. But first on our agenda today, we have Amy Soswadell, and Amy couldn't be with us live today, so she created a video presentation, and it's called Growing and Caring for a Team, and I know you're going to find this really valuable. Amy has been with Marriage Initiative for just a little over five years, and she serves as the HR and Finance Director, and she gets to combine her two passions, people and numbers. She's been married to her husband, Todd, for 18 years years and they're kept busy raising three amazing children and Amy also loves being involved with her church family having coffee with friends playing board games walking and reading and I'm just really excited Amy is an amazing person and I am really excited for you to get to watch Amy's presentation today good afternoon everyone my name is Amy Salswoodell with the marriage initiative I have been with the Marriage Initiative for five years now, serving in a variety of roles. Currently, I'm serving as the HR and Finance Director, but one of the things I've had the pleasure of helping with since I joined the team is helping to grow our team. So that is what I'll be sharing about today. When I went to do the first round of this, I realized there was a lot more information that I wanted to share with y'all than I had time for today. So there is a longer version of this PowerPoint presentation. If you find that you're getting to the point where you do want to begin hiring or have any um, thing going on that I mentioned today, you'll want to check that out on our YouTube page. And I did list my email address. If there's any questions you have about anything I share today, I would love for you to reach out to me. Now, when Steph and Carl told me that we would be speaking about building organizational capacity today, um, I don't know about you, but that brings a lot of things to mind for me from previous job roles and just knowing what that entails. It can seem overwhelming and it like a lot of work. You might think of hiring and training and paperwork and administration, but today I wanted to reframe that into really what it is, which is growing and caring for your team. Now, I chose those words intentionally when we think about growing something, whether that's uh, you know thinking about how we are involved in our children's growth or thinking about a garden, you do think about work, but you also think about other things like tending to and forethought and planning and intentionality and care. And when you wrap all those things together, what that really is, is care for the thing being grown. Now, while things could grow still when left to their own devices, oftentimes the end result is not as healthy as if there was care and forethought and planning put into it. And from an organizational standpoint, if there is no care or thought given, often the outcome is not a team. That's often not what you end up with. So I wanted us to keep that in mind today, and I thought this image was just a very powerful illustration that we could have in our mind when we think about what we're doing here, building organizational capacity, but really growing and caring for a team. No one would happen upon this and think that it just happened accidentally, and the same thing goes with our teams. Now there comes a point in every organization when the workload exceeds the man hours of the people on the team currently, or maybe there's a need that you're continually bumping up against, uh, whether that's graphic design or bookkeeping, the current team members just don't have the giftings or the skill sets or the time to handle those things, and that is the time when you may want to hire. Now I love this quote, I probably could have chosen a number of quotes from a number of different leaders, but I think it communicates two important truths that we want to keep in mind as we think about what we're talking about today of growing our teams, is that people are definitely a company's greatest asset, number one, and the second part, it talks about the people it keeps. When we take the effort uh, to go through the hiring process and finding good talent and good team members to join the team, we want to keep those team members. 
Here are some principles that we have found over the years for growing your team. Number one is prayer, and I know that seems obvious, but I couldn't leave it off the slide. Prayer for us is not an afterthought or something that comes later in the process. Prayer comes in at every single aspect of hiring from the time we're thinking about if it's the right time to hire, to who God may be bringing, to reviewing the applicants, to even determining if God is doing something different than we may be able to realize at the moment. And that goes into our second point, which is to stay curious about what God is doing. Oftentimes when you go into looking for a team member, you may have something very concrete in your mind. And we have just seen over the years uh, that staying curious about what God is doing, even if that looks different from what you had originally thought, is definitely a principle to keep in mind. Third, don't limit yourself and stay flexible. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on, but there are ways when we're seeking to post a job advertisement or even at any point in the process where we're unintentionally limiting ourselves and we're kind of remaining inflexible. And finally, preparation and communication are key. While we are relying on God and seeing what he is doing and staying open to that, we also can't be unprepared as we go into this process. Good communication and good preparation are definitely necessary. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is determine what the need is. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on this slide, but there are things on here that you may want to be a little more flexible than you had originally thought. Um, also, there are areas where you may not be able to be as flexible, such as the hourly rate. There may be only, you may only be able to go up an, an extra dollar or two due to budget constraints, and that's okay, but there are other areas on here that you can add some flexibility in. What we have learned in this area is um, using a very broad range of hours has worked really well for us. So not defining your hours so specifically that it has to be 30 hours a week. Our last job posting, we put 12 to 25 hours, which seems kind of, wow, would it really be the same type of talent you're looking for if it could be a person that could do it in 12 versus 25? And we found on our team, we actually have more people working less hours. There's a lot of our team members that are only working around the 10 to 15 hour a week range versus the 30 hour a week range. So maybe God is choosing to bring two team members when you originally were only seeking one. So that's where it goes back to staying flexible and staying curious. Also pay attention to job titles. Um, our last job posting, we put research specialist as one of the job titles because the person would be doing research on a national level for marriage and family strengthening events and seeking organizations. What we didn't take into consideration is other job titles that, and roles that that could conflict with. We had a lot of applicants where their previous roles were in a laboratory. And so sometimes, especially if someone's using a paid site like ZipRecruiter, they're only gonna be querying on jobs that have a specific buzzword in the title. And so if you can kind of think about that and make sure you have the most accurate job title, that will be very helpful. We've also found that remote works well for our team members with some in-person check-ins. That is something you can determine in the hiring stages when you're talking with applicants, if they would be available to ever come into the office for training or to come to a team meeting occasionally. Remote works great, and we have some team members that are 100% remote, but we've found what's even better is remote with some check-ins. And then finally, a warning to just not have in your mind what you deem to be the right credentials, whether that's a certificate you think that is necessary or even someone that had the exact same job before. Um, just be open to what God may be doing and looking for those transferable skills that could still fit your posting. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail on this slide, but these are just some ways that we use to get the word out. I'll talk about that a little more on the next slide. Um, there's pros and cons to each of these. Some are free, some cost money, some take a little bit of thought on the front end um, of getting some things set up, whether that's a website that you use, but these are all great ways to get the word out once those details are set for your job posting. Some things that we have learned in this area, we use as many methods as possible. We use all of those methods listed on the previous slide. We've also found that it's helpful to create a web landing page for hiring. So just a tab on your website that has all of those details needed for the applicant to know which jobs are open, what those requirements are, where they could submit resumes. 
We've also found as we've grown and more people are involved in the hiring process to create a hiring email that everyone has access to. The password is shared across the team so that um, when applicants are sent in or things are needing to be reviewed and looked at, that it's not just going to one person. This also helps when you're responding back to applicants and saying thank you for submitting your resume and letting them know steps in the process that they don't have your personal email address um, and that you're dealing with them from just a centralized email. That's been very helpful. Another thing, it sounds obvious is but to know who you are. When you're going to be putting your job postings out there, a lot of things, um, especially on sites like ZipRecruiter, they want to know a little bit about what you do, what your mission is, what do you value. And so you need to have that nailed down as well. That's also something that will be asked about when you're interviewing candidates. Those are things that they want to know. So as you're creating language for websites or brochures um, and setting up your marriage initiatives, this is something that's also helpful and will come into play for hiring. Finally, I just thought it was worth mentioning that ZipRecruiter has filled 75% of our openings. It does have a cost to it, but I did want to mention um, every single time we've used ZipRecruiter to hire, I have asked if there was a discount available, and there always has been, so definitely ask about that. And then they always assign you an agent that helps you go through your posting and helps get traffic to those postings for you, and they will meet with you as many times as available, so I would definitely use that as a resource. You're going to come into the reviewing applicant stage. I'm not also going to address every single thing on this slide due to time constraints, but one thing I will mention that's been very helpful to us is using a screening question as a tool. For our last round, we said, what really excites you about our mission um, or what excites you about joining our team. Those are great screening tools. They're very open-ended. It's not yes or no, and they really have to put some forethought into that. And that can really be the difference um, in seeing some of those answers. It really sets some people apart. Um, or it signals as well if they just choose not to answer it at all, even though it's been made very clear, clear that it, that was something that was asked of them. That kind of shows attention to detail and just can show a little bit of their heart as well in those answers, so we really recommend doing that. Even if you don't use Zip Recruit Recruiter, there is a place where you could put that on your website and just ask that they submit an answer for that as well. You're going to get to the interviewing and follow-up communication once you have um, a handful of folks that you do want to move forward with and get to know a little more and see if they'd be a good fit. Phone screens are so helpful. Um, I've handled about 95% of the phone screens on our team and that is just a great time before more people are involved in the hiring process to see if those things that you put out in the job posting, um, if they line up with the person that has applied. If it's a wide range of hours that were listed, are they preferring the lower end or the higher end? Is the hourly rate listed going to be a deal breaker for them? You would be surprised how many people, even though an hourly rate is set maybe at $20 an hour, we're really hoping for $40. Um, so clearing up some of that stuff on the front end and just clarifying information is very helpful. I'm not going to address everything on this slide, but another thing that I will say that I think is important is to communicate well from the start. Be honest. Some of those things you're going to be able to be flexible on um, as they're getting to know you and you're getting to know them. There may be things that um, they just need to have honest answers for, and that will help you as well in the long run to know if they're a good fit. If $40 an hour is not in the cards, this is a great time to share that and to communicate that honestly. Also be enthusiastic. My goal is always for the person to end the phone call with me more excited than when they started. They applied for a reason um, and they're obviously interested in our team and potentially being a part of it. And so my goal is just to express enthusiasm for our organization and what we do and our mission and the team members and the leadership. Um, so I always want that to come across as well. This um, slide, I also am not going to take the time to address every single one, so please reach out to me if you have questions about any of this specific paperwork. I tried to address that there definitely is administrative things that are needed when you make an offer. One thing I will say is just be prepared. One of the things we go over in phone screens is when could you start, and um, maybe the person can start tomorrow. They're ready immediately, but your team is not. So you have that flexibility to set a date for their first day in their onboarding when it is good for you and you're prepared for them. You want it to be a good experience when they join your team. So make sure that that first day um, and that onboarding experience that you're ready. 
That goes into our next section of caring for your team. There is a way to care for your team in a professional setting, and I'll go into some more details about what that looks like. These are some principles we've found for caring for your team, and the bottom line, I love this quote by Brene Brown, it says, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. A lot about caring for your team in a professional setting has to do with clarity. Set clear expectations. Be who you said you are. Those are some things that you put out in the job posting about who you are and what you were looking for, um, or even the things that were communicated during the interview process. Make sure that that's true when the person arrives. Allow them to be a valued team member. They had skill sets um, that they were hoping to use and they wanted to contribute in a certain way on your team and allow them that opportunity to do that. And then once again, preparation and communication also comes into this stage as well. Onboarding is super important. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do um, from little to grandiose gestures to make it a great, great first day, but that is the bottom line. Make it a great first day for the person joining your team. Make sure that they're properly introduced. These are also not things that can only be done if you are an in-person team. These are all things that could be done remote. You could have a Zoom first day welcome to make sure that the team member is properly introduced. Um, you could even send a welcome card instead of having something on that person's desk if they're not in person. You could send a little welcome card or a welcome care package if you have organizational swag such as pens with your name on it or notebooks. Those are nice little touches that the person feels really cared for. Make sure set up, uh, trainings are set up in advance that the person comes and that they have something to do and that they feel like you are ready for them and that they also have the tools that they need to thrive. Do they need an email address? Do they need access to certain things to do their work? Whether it's Canva or MailChimp, are you ready for them? Because those first impressions really do go both ways. Some other things that you can do for the first day, I've listed a number of them here. Um, just basically them knowing who's who. Do you have an organizational chart? Is there information they could be reading about their, your organization to learn who you are? Payroll processes is usually something that they're aware of and I have the information that I need by the first day, but I wanna go over that again with them because as much as people love um, the mission and a lot of our team members are working for less than they could in the corporate world, people still wanna make sure that they're getting paid and know the process for that. And then having the supervisor available on that first day is also important. That goes back to making sure that you're prepared and ready for them. Having that time set aside with the supervisor to set expectations is very important. Our employee handbook was mentioned on the previous slide. I'll just go into it in a little more detail here. This is something we have available as a guide for all the cities, but I do want to make a very important note. We really want you to consult with professionals that are well-versed in employment law in your own state. As you can see, this document's very thorough. It's 22 pages ranging from code of conduct to distracted driving policy um, to how does somebody go about getting reimbursed for things to conflict resolution? Um, some other ideas for you besides just using this as a guide is to talk to other nonprofits in your state and see if they would be willing to let you look at their document. There may be some language or some things that you'd find helpful in theirs. And then another resource we use that I'll talk more about on the next slide is Alliance Defending Freedom. Also, we review this every year for its accuracy and making sure it's still relevant and nothing needs to be changed. And our team members do as well. Every year they acknowledge everything within this document and sign. Alliance Defending Freedom is something we have a membership for. I've listed the website and then the price that we pay is $500 a year. I believe most everybody here, no one would be paying more than that, but their pricing is listed on their website. And really what this allows is access to attorneys, they review documents for you. Um, you can see some more of the benefits I listed on the slide, but when I set out to do our employee handbook, I had it reviewed by one of their attorneys several times and they helped us make the language stronger and really what they were doing too is helping us to make things very clear. This goes back to caring for your team. Um, and the ADF lawyers agreed as well that clear is kind and you get into a lot less trouble when things are very clear, not only for your employees and your team members, but even for people outside of your organization. Is it clear how you operate? Is it clear who you are? And one of those things that, that goes back to is the employee handbook and that's something that you can make very clear as well. 
Now you want them to have a great first start, but you want the feedback and the communication to continue throughout their time with you. So communicate well and often. I love this little graphic that says awesome this way, less awesome this way. And that's really just a, a word picture of what you want to do for your team members. You want them to know what success looks like. You want to provide the roadmap and the tools for that. So pay attention to how often you're checking in with your team members and um, also pay attention to their gifting. Most of our team members started in one position and now are doing something entirely different because Carl pays attention to people's giftings and he encourages everybody supervising team members to do the same. That shows that you value the person, um, their role, their contribution, and also you're thinking of their growth and could they be doing um, something different to use their skill sets and can they grow with your organization? Employee reviews is an official way that we provide feedback. We do this twice a year. Um, I have this available as well to share. It's a form, a Google form, um, that it could be easily shared and modified for your organizations. And what we really cover is just looking at the past, looking at the person's role currently, our team culture and values, looking ahead and goal setting for what the future looks like, specific feedback for the supervisor, and any other questions the employee has. I've found um, just in doing exit interviews for people that have needed to leave our organization for um, even just good reasons like moving, that a lot of the questions you ask a person during an exit interview are the same type of things that you ask during employee reviews. And I found that to be very interesting. And it really just goes to show the importance of communication. If you're talking about these things regularly with your team members, um, none of our employees left for reasons that were anything was majorly wrong, but in a lot of organizations they do, and a lot of times it boils down to a problem that could have been solved earlier if feedback and communication was happening. And that just goes to a quote that Carl loves and shares with our organization often. It's never let a problem to be solved become more important than a person to be loved. And really what we're doing in caring for our team members and having clear communication and having guidelines and processes set up so that they know what success looks like is really you're trying to avoid those problems that come about. And you're also showing care and love to your team members. Next, we're going to talk about being a team. The end result of growing and caring for our team well is at the end of the day, we want to have a team and not just a bunch of siloed individuals working by themselves. Some principles for being a team, connect regularly. We, we make it a point to connect with our team members regularly. Create opportunities for those team members to be known. Have fun, fellowship, learn and grow together. And then have shared purpose and vision. I love the quote by Helen Keller, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. And that is so true, especially when you're operating as a team versus individuals. Some tools to connect. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on this slide. I, I will say that Slack has been a great tool for our remote team, and we would love to share that with anyone that wants more information or training on that. Have ways for people to be known. We have it as a part of our agenda. We have things built in so that people can be known. We do prayers and praises, icebreakers, moments in the word. So whether they just read a Bible passage that morning that they want to share, or it's a devotional that they love, or even we've listened to songs together. We also add in games and friendly competition every now and then. It's not a part of every single team me meeting, but we do have meetings that are specifically for that. And then we have a favorite things form when a team member joins where they can fill that out and we can get to know them, whether that's what their favorite coffee is to their favorite author. It's just a way for you to just know your team members a little more. I want to just stress that meetings are more than meetings. Those are your time that you're becoming a team. Whether that's in person or virtual, try to meet regularly. Our team aims to meet weekly unless there are a lot of team members out. Also, we have special meetings we try to do quarterly that are just for fellowship and fun. We've taken field trips together. We've went to the courthouse and sat in on divorce proceedings. And that really just, it's a way to get out of the office, but also to do something purposeful to know that you are working towards something and to kind of see those faces and the people that you're aiming to help. We've done learnings together where we're, we've done team trainings. Um, we did a DISC assessment where we each learned about our DISC profile and there was time for us to learn individually and then come together to learn. We aim to celebrate good times together. Um, 
birthdays are a big deal. Anniversaries are a big deal. We want to know about team members' family. Um, their favorite things, once again, uh, comes into play. We enjoy our time together. I love that I know little things about my team members, whether that's that one of them has a sh crazy shoe collection or another one loves banana pudding. I just love knowing those things and that really just helps us to have a fun time together. Little things make a big difference. And then that shared purpose comes back to play. We're on mission together. We're working towards a common goal. One of us may be doing finance and one of us may be doing donor relations and another social media, but we are working with a common purpose. We also appreciate one another's strengths. I love that there's someone on our team that's great with graphic design and creativity because that is not one of my strong suits. So I celebrate my team members' strengths. We also celebrate one another's wins. Um, we, we know what each person's working on and how hard um, the work that they're putting in behind the scenes. So when there is a breakthrough and something to celebrate, we love to do that together. We also love to collaborate and support one another. There are things that sometimes we need to brainstorm or be praying about and helping one another and we do that as well. That's all part of being a team. What we've learned is just to be creative. Technology has allowed that this stuff can happen. You can really truly be a team and do a lot of these things, even remotely and even when you're in separate locations. Be intentional and don't let busyness of your work schedule or your individual lives crowd out the team building because that's so important. And then balance the needs of your team. Not everybody is going to love the same types of fun. So, so mix in different types of things and um, know your team. Whether who, people don't like to be put on the spot, put up, now we put out our icebreakers in advance so that people have some time to think about it in advance and know what they're going to be walking into for a team meeting. So just kind of get to know your team and mix it up a little bit. In conclusion, I just wanted to share this powerful image again. Um, I do encourage you to check out that extended PowerPoint if you want to find out more information um, or any more of the in-depth areas that I went into a little bit more detail. But really this goes back to us just coming together and working to grow something beautiful, caring for it well, and having a team as the end result. Thank you again. Um, I've enjoyed being here with you today. I'm so passionate about all the things that I discussed with you. I wish we had more time together and I truly would love to connect. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. Well, all right. Amy has also created, as she said, an extended version of growing and caring for a team that I'm going to be sharing with you all through the follow-up email, as well as the resource package that she referred to. I'll be sharing that with you and you can take and customize and adapt to fit your needs. And you can also feel free to email Amy with any questions you may have. I'm going to send her email address in the follow-up email as well, in case you weren't able to catch that in the video. And so up next, we have the privilege of hearing from Amy Guilford of the Maryland Marriage Initiative, Executive Director of MREC since 2015. She's worked diligently since the organization was founded in 2004 to elevate the importance of healthy marriages and families in Maryland. And she follows in the footsteps of her amazing parents, Bill and Ann McKenna, who are the co-founders and former directors of the state's very first marriage initiative. And Amy has focused on expanding student programming and church partnerships in recent years, and she's certified in numerous relationship education curricula. She's an alumni of James Madison University and a graduate of the Carroll County Chamber of Camp Commerce's leadership program. She serves on the Chamber's Legislative Committee. She loves to speak to civic groups on what kids are saying about marriage and relationships. She's a member of several community organizations. She's a dedicated coffee drinker, and that's important. And Amy has completed her Master Gardener exam, and she's an ESL instructor at her church where she is now helping to develop their first marriage ministry team, and she's been married to her husband, Jim, since 1984, and the couple is blessed with four adult children, three of whom are married, and they have several grandchildren, and Amy is going to be sharing today on developing a board of directors, and if you haven't yet had the privilege of meeting Amy, I just want to tell you that you are in for a treat. Amy is amazing, and I can't wait 
for you to hear from her. So Amy, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Steph. You're always um, generous uh, with all the comments that you share with all the people that, um, that you interact with. And that's what I have grown to love so much about uh, working with you. Um, the topic of board development came up in our Maryland uh, team meeting with Carl and Steph uh, in the past. And some of the things that we've learned, uh, we were asked to pass along to you. We are, um, our, so our organization is 20 years old this year. So we're celebrating all year long, turning 20. So we are definitely, um, if you look at the boardsource.com and get a description of different board levels as, as the a board grows as an organization grows and matures. Uh, we are at we are past the uh, the founders level, um, where we are developing your initial documents, your five hundred one c three, and basically your friends and family are helping you start that organization, which is what Bill and Ann did. And we're a second level board at this point, where we are a, developing a governing board. And as that uh, has happened, we've had some amazing help along the way. And I just need to qualify that I am working with a wonderful board right now. And uh, great people who are um, passionate about marriage have strong skills that they bring to the table and they're very generous with their time, talent and resources. So I, I love them dearly and I appreciate them so much. Um, some things that we have learned because like you, um, we are continuing to grow. When you hit that middle level of a growing organization, you start to hit some friction as you're looking at roles and responsibilities and bringing on people to help you get to the next level. So when we hit some hiccups over the last couple of years, it occurred to us, we really need to go back and look at our onboarding process and look at the documents that we're asking people to sign and to do a little bit more research on our part on and who is coming aboard. So I have just one slide for you with a couple of uh, thoughts um, that have percolated up over the last year as we've uh, rolled out our new documents. And probably like many of you, you know, we. Be, I should also say some people might be wondering where do you find your board members? Well, I'm I'm out and about just like our co-founder Bill McKenna is. Um, I'm every place people is are, <laughs> I'm actively involved in our chamber and I'm interacting with business leaders. From the very beginning, I have not stayed in the nonprofit circle as we have grown MRAC. I have just inserted myself into the business community because I wanna learn how to grow an organization like business people grow their businesses. And LinkedIn is a tremendous source of, of contact information and so are my own donors. So I'm regularly picking the brains of those who are already supporting us, who already get the mission and vision and seeing who they can expand our world with because of the people they know and the influence they have. So once we have them or are considering them for board membership, um, we've created a, a board matrix um, that compares their skills with other skills of board members so we can see what we have and where our gaps are and gives us a focus on, on where to look. Yes, we're looking for people that are good, solid Christians. Yes, we're looking for people who are marriage champions, but we also need a skill set and a couple of different areas to help us accomplish our mission and vision. Um, we overlooked being an active church member in the past, and maybe this is just us. We tend to assume because people are nice and we've met them in church or we've seen them at church events um, that they're just a church member. But in order to grow a marriage initiative and we're relying on churches, we really are honing in on this fact. We want a person to be a member of a church, not just attending a church. And uh, we want to see that their uh, church leadership uh, is supportive of them and understands that they're getting involved in a marriage initiative. So we have the church's support and backing also. Um, we've had some people that were floating for a long time between church memberships before and realized that they lost contact with the church community that we needed them to help engage. And we wanted to improve that aspect. So it's a, a win for our board, but it's also a win for the church when they're actively and engaged as a part of a church family. Uh, another thing that we focused on is either prior experience on um, a board or a board ministry. Again, this is a second level, a middle level organization. 
um, we're moving past friends and family to people who have legitimate um, board experience, either professionally, social, or on a church ministry. And if they have not, but they seem like an amazing, you know, gifted person, we've added this component of working with them on a project or a cause for some time. So we get to interact with them. You know, how do they um, deal with people? How, what happens when conflict comes up? Um, how do they interact with the people on our team? We wanted to give an opportunity to understand a little bit better who we are and the kinds of things that we do before they just say, yeah, I'm in. Um, we wanted to see them at work first uh, before we invite them to our board and realize, man, this wasn't exactly a good fit. Um, the, the final thing is, and, and I've shared this document with Stephanie, is that we have a, a board folder that our board members get, and it has everything from the history of our organization to our mission, vision, values, all of our policies, our tax documents, so that they know they're getting involved in an organization that, that pays its bills and does is not going to get them in trouble with the government <laughs> for not paying their taxes. Uh, we include all those VIP documents in there as well. And we sit down and we go through that with them and we give them the history. Um, they know who our staff is. They knew who the other board members are that they're coming on board with also. All our board bios are included on that. So this is just a tightening process for us. Some of these things I think we took for granted over the years that we were just gonna attract the right kind of people. But I've learned that it really does take some intentionality to get the, the next level of serious, committed professional who is also a Christian um, to help us move this mission beyond um, the neighborhood and into you know, the state and the region. So maybe simple, maybe some of y'all have already figured these out already, um, but I just wanted to share these with you because we're learning and I thought maybe some of you all might be at the same process the step along the way that we are. And I saw a question pop up there, Stephanie, um, but I missed it. Was that in the chat? Yeah, let me see. Okay. Chat, we see it. Oh, I see it's from Debbie Hall. Could I please repeat the site you use to determine the level of your board? Sure, that's boardsource.com. And that is an amazing resource for um, identifying committees, roles, processes, um, how to function in so many ways. It's sort of a gold standard uh, in how to um, develop and, and have good board practices and policies. Great. That's all I have to share. I'm happy to share any of these documents that, that we've created that people might want to use as a guide to creating their own. Um, some of these things that we have were shared with us and we've um, augmented them or enlarged them to meet our needs. So there might be some things in there that might be helpful to somebody else to create some stronger documents as, as they're um, developing their board. Yes, thank you so much. And Amy, as she said, she has provided some valuable resources from MREC that you can adapt and make your own. And I'll be sending those out in our follow-up email. And we do want to remind you that when adapting any of the resources that we provide along these lines to consult with the laws in your state, because every state is different. So you will want to check that out. But Amy, thank you so much for sharing with us today. We enjoyed hearing from you. You're welcome. And up next on Ways to Empower People, we get to hear from a power couple in our CMI family, Dave and Cheryl Belden. And Dave and Cheryl, they've been married for 42 years. They're executive directors with the Healthy Marriage Coalition in Fresno, California. They direct marriage education and training classes for couples and mentors. They have taught marriage classes for more than 30 years. They're trained in as facilitators in marriage works, adventures in marriage, and they're also certified in Prepare Enrich. The Beldons have two married children and five grandchildren living in Fresno. And today, Dave and Cheryl are going to be sharing their insights from years of experience on recruiting volunteers for marriage ministry. So Dave and Cheryl, whenever you are ready, we can't wait to hear from you. Well, thank you. Uh, we certainly are a little intimidated by sharing with uh, all the wisdom that has already come out already today. Um, 
But after talking to, to Carl and Steph on, the, on our meeting, and we were talking about volunteers, uh, we did realize that we have been blessed with some really great volunteers that have helped our ministry. And we'd love to share a little bit uh, how those came about. So uh, here we go. Um, volunteers are very important to us. We've, we've kind of chosen not to go the employee route, uh, partly because of all the things that we shared. That's that's a lot of work. Uh, and then you also have to do fundraising and stuff to pay those employees. So we really uh, rely heavily on volunteers. Uh, and then as we were talking about our volunteers, we, we really realized we have like two tiers of volunteer, two different kinds of volunteers. Uh, the first kind of volunteer is once you go ahead and explain that. Okay. So the first volunteers we have are like friends and our friends and our family and um, people that we know at church or in the Christian community. And um, they're the kind of volunteers that we use like once or twice a year. And we have events and we invite them to come alongside us and help. They do things like checking people in or cutting dessert and putting it out, serving food, um, a lot of different things like that. Um, they believe in our ministry. They really want to help us out, but they're not the kind that are going to get in there and like teach a class. Um, so they teach, they, they tell people about, they share about our ministry. They're so excited about it. And so they're so excited to be able to share in this kind of thing. And we have to be really purposeful about asking these volunteers because otherwise we end up doing everything ourselves. And that's just too hard on us because we have a certain skill, skill set um, of what we do and they can do those other things for us. I think it's common, at least for us, that sometimes we think we have to do everything because we do it better. And the fact is we're missing an opportunity to allow people to come alongside. Uh, they like to do that. Uh, the couples that do this, even though it's only once or twice a year, uh, they're certainly more engaged with what's going on. They they um, advertise for us. They tell other people about us. It's just important to bring those people along. Uh, and yet we have to have to be purposeful in doing that. Uh, but that's not the main group we want to talk about. Right. But but for this this group also, um, we let them like attend our events for free, and they really like that too. Like, hey, we're having this you know this date night, and you come and help, and you can come for free, and they love that. And then um, like recently, we like bought them little aprons, and we put their name on them, you know, so they can wear those, and so they really love to help us out. It, it's all about relationships. It's the relationships we deal with them, we develop with them. Uh, it it just we couldn't do what we do without them. So that's kind of the, the first section that really we didn't even know we had separated in yeah. our mind, but it is. Uh, but we want to talk about the other uh, volunteers we have. And they're the ones that actually are going to teach the classes that, that Cheryl and I teach. Um, if we want to expand our ministry, we have to be able to teach others to do what we do. Uh, and this is definitely more challenging uh, to find these people uh, because we're looking for some specific things. Uh, we need somebody we need a couple because we do it with couples so the couples teach uh, the class that we're talking about um and they need to be vulnerable uh it's so important again on the classes that we do uh we're not looking for a lecturer uh we're looking for someone that will be real uh our experience is the people that come to our classes uh they need to see people that are vulnerable uh their marriage isn't perfect and yet they're going to share the things that they've learned. And so the couples, uh, the way we find them is generally they've come to one of our classes before. Uh, and as we we coach them and we start learning about them, we realize they have a, a passion for their marriage. Uh, we realize that they uh, they like what they've learned. The tools have been helpful for them and they're using the tools. And so they want to share the tools. Um, yeah. So. Like Dave said, oftentimes we find the couples because they've come to a class and so they're interested in bettering their marriage. But we also find couples like, hey, we know this couple. They're really a quality couple. You should come to a class, you know, and so that you can learn about what we do because we would love to, you know, use you too. So once we get to know the couple a little bit and we think that they, you know, have some of those those skills and the, the ability to to share those things, uh, what we do with them is we bring them along. So the first thing we would do is we teach them to coach with us. So they mm -hmm. coach in the class that we teach. Mm -hmm. um, after that is if they're still 
you know, excited about it, we actually let them teach part of the class that we're doing that night. So we're with them the whole time. Uh, we're encouraging them. Um, people, I, I think God likes to use this in a place that we're uncomfortable uh, because then we rely on him. And so when we get a lot of our volunteers, they don't feel comfortable. And we tell them, great, that's exactly where you need to be because that's where we are. Um, that's going to allow God working through us and not on their own power. So part of this coming alongside is actually trying to strengthen their faith in the same way. Uh, I guarantee any volunteers that we try and get, Satan is going to try and put things in their way. Does the same thing, I think, in all of your marriages, in all your ministries, because Satan doesn't want us to be successful. But we have a big God, and we have to focus on that, that God will win. Uh, so I think the spiritual part is very important that we encourage along the way. Right. So, um, yeah. So we find them in our class. And then, like Dave said, we um, they're in, they're excited. They're about it. They're like, gosh, you know, we would love to do this, too. So we're like, OK, we'll come to another class. We want you to learn the curriculum. We want you to learn the material. We want you to become confident with that. So they come along. We're coaching them. We're investing time in them. We have them over to our house. Sometimes after a class, we say you should go through prepare and rich. You know, because that's that online assessment about their relationship. And so we spend time, we get to know them better. They get to pour into their marriage better. They're, they become stronger together. And um, so these are some of the things that we we do with them. And then as they um, are becoming better, we like Dave said, did you say already? Um, we have them teach a section of the class. So um, we know that's going to be overwhelming for them. It was overwhelming for us too when Ron had us, you know, doing that at the beginning. And um, so we're like, hey, why don't you just model a daily appreciation? And so we'll teach what that's about and we'll have them go up and do it. So it's like baby steps, you know, getting them comfortable in teaching the class and presenting. And so they take one step forward and we kind of see how they do in that step. And if they do well, we just keep giving them more. Right? We had one couple that, Gosh, they were absolutely great at greeting everybody. They actually, as a church, it was a big church. Uh, we didn't know anybody there, and they would greet everybody for us. They they talked very highly of the skills that they view that they use uh, that they've learned from us, uh, and they wanted to share it with others. And so um, we were excited to use them. We did some training with them as far as coaching. Uh, this seemed like they were great. So the first night we're in our class, and it's time for coaching, and we turn around, and I can't find him anywhere. It's like, well, what's going on? Well, he learned that, or he learned about himself that he thought it was more important that the cars were safe in the parking lot and he was on security duty. Uh, and it, it really came down to that was just too much for him to coach. They're still a great couple. They greet people. They know everybody. So part of it is is learning what kind of volunteer you have. Uh, what are their strengths? What are their strengths? Yeah. And that, and we just missed, missed on that one. Yeah. Um, so but, she was great, though. She yeah. was in, she wanted to coach, you know, but that was too much for him. So we're like, okay, now we know their strengths. <laughs> Live and learn. Yeah. Uh, this whole process takes a long time. Um, the volunteers that we have, they have, they've been with us for Several a lot of years, years now. Yeah. Uh, but we have to keep looking because some of those volunteers are going to leave. We have a call. Uh, a couple of volunteers right now that are, are moving to another state and we're really disappointed. And yet they're going uh, to be part of a church and they're taking the marriage ministry there. So we're very excited for them, but we hate to lose them. So we have to continually be looking for uh, the next set of volunteers. Uh, I think that's going to be an ongoing thing. Uh, what has happened with the volunteers we have, though, is, you know, Cheryl and I can only teach so many classes so many nights a week. But we have couples out now that at, at certain churches they just do it totally without us, uh, and so it, you know, we're able to expand our ministry uh, because of volunteers like that. So I'd say it takes a lot of time, uh, it takes effort, but it is it is wonderful effort as far as we enjoy the couple, we enjoy encouraging them. Uh, I would tell you that there are friends now that you know we 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 have food together, we enjoy each other. Uh, and we're going to keep doing that. I, we would love to hear from you guys what you do, too. Yeah. And, you know, these volunteers that we have, they really see the benefit in being around um, our ministry and being with like minded couples so that they can strengthen their marriage, too. You know, we talk about different things and we we get together and, and they just they like being around us. And so that really helps to keep them around, too. Right. 
I think that's about our 10 minutes. We would love to answer any questions. Uh, feel free to contact us uh, at any time. It would be, it, we'd love it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dave and Cheryl, for sharing with us today. I loved what you shared about, you know, finding people's strengths because that's where they're going to that's where they're going to flourish. And that's where they're going to be the happiest. They're going to be the most passionate about their work. And so I, I love that that you said that. And Dave and Cheryl also created a nice bookmark for National Marriage Week, and they have made the Canva template available to all of us. So I'm going to be sharing that in our follow up email as as well. And you can take that and customize it and use it for your city if you'd like. You can tell that this follow-up email is going to be packed full of things. So you're going to be on the lookout for that. Um, so thank you so much, Dave and Cheryl, for sharing with us today. We really appreciate you. And as we wrap up our session today on empowering people, it's time for us to move into our Q&A session. And we always love hearing from all of you. Our speakers are all ready to answer any questions that you might have. So don't be shy. This is your chance to engage and deepen our discussion here. And it doesn't have to be a question. If you have a comment or an insight that you'd like to share, we would absolutely love to hear from you. So if you would just just raise your virtual hand if you have a question for us today. I see Bill has his hand raised. Got it. There you are. Helper was coming too. <laughs> really, a couple of comments really on that volunteering. Number one, it's kind of like what Jesus said. Uh, I came to serve, not to be served. And that's the best way to be able to learn about volunteering is by being a volunteer yourself. Once you learn what it's like, what it's about, what the excitement is, then you know what you're looking for in other volunteers because you've pretty much set the example of what a good volunteer is all about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Bill. We appreciate that. Does anyone else have any questions or comments or anything they would like to share today? All right, I see Shane has his hand raised. Go right ahead, Shane, you are muted. Uh, Renee wanted me to ask uh, Dave and Cheryl, um, I know they said they use Prepare and Enrich. What were the other two uh, things that you use for those? We couples? use um, Adventures in Marriage. And then we also use our own curriculum that we created. It's called Marriage Works. And they're is both that, about six-week classes. Is that available, Marriage Works? Um, you can contact us and we can show it, you it. Yeah. Fa fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to connect you through email. So I, I will make that connection in case you don't have each other's emails. Does anyone else have any questions or comments before we close out today? All right. Well, oh, I see Bill. Go right ahead, Bill. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and everything Amy was saying before, you know, what's behind all that, which is very important as, as she looks at people, as we look at people, is what kind of impact are they making in the community already? What kind of ties do they have? Who do they know? And what do they bring to our board based on the various uh, affiliations they have in the community? Connectors and gatekeepers, right. And I just really appreciated Amy's um, pre-recorded session earlier. That was powerful. <laughs> And um, we were in the middle of some interviewing right now, and some of the other CMIs have been so helpful with us in crafting some job descriptions. So I'm appreciate of all you guys across the country who always are willing to help us. But she, uh, just that being flexible, you know, you have this job description and you're looking for this person that's got to fit in the box. And then somebody comes in with these amazing job description skills that you didn't even think about how they could apply and you're like, okay, we got to back up and how, I don't want to lose these people. Let's look at our job description again, <laughs> you know? So I thought that was very insightful. Some of the things she shared and so helpful right now when I needed it personally. Yeah, um, the extended version, she goes into a, a lot more detail. And so I'm sure that you will enjoy that as well. I'll be sending that out to you. 
Well, as we bring the training event to a close today, we do want to announce to you that next month's training event is going to cover partnerships with non-traditional allies. And I know that many of you are branching out into this more and more, so we're really looking forward to covering this important topic. And once again, I do just want to let you know that I will be sending the link to the recording of this event. I'll be sending that extended version of Growing and Caring for a Team from Amy. I'll be sending resources from all of our speakers. And then also friends of the family in Lynn Benton, Oregon have shared a list of documents that they would be willing to share with any city who's interested in Friends of the Family has been in existence for many years and they have a lot of really good policies and strategies. And so I will be sharing that list with you in the follow-up email. And so just be on the lookout for that email that's gonna be full of lots of resources for you. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me at sammy.soltbins at gmail.com if you need anything at all. And we just wanna say thank you guys so much for joining us today. We love all of you. We appreciate you and, and we're just very thankful and grateful for all of you. So until next time, take care and goodbye. You guys have a nice weekend. Bye.